So, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Wendy Byrne. I'm the president of the college, and welcome to this afternoon's webinar entitled COVID-19, Working on the Front Line. We have over 600 people signed up to um, attend today, uh, so, so thank you all. We're going to have the speakers first, and then at the end there will be time um, for questions. We might not get through all the questions today, but we'll collect all the ones that, that you send in, um, and eventually they will be answered, and we'll put the answers um, on the website. There's a question and answer panel on the side that you can use to type in your um, questions. Um, and please keep tweeting them throughout the event. And if you could use the hashtag RCPsychLive. So our first um, three speakers are from the Nightingale Hospital um, in London, and they're going to tell us a bit about their work there. Uh, we have Derek Tracy. He's a consultant psychiatrist and clinical director of the National Innovative Integrated Directorate of Mental and Physical Health and Social Care at Oxley's NHS Foundation Trust in London. He's a senior lecturer at King's and the University College London and sits on the executive of the college's academic faculty. He's a member of the Advisory Council on the Misuse of Drugs. He's a board member of the British Journal of Psychiatry. He writes its highlights and its kaleidoscope and he leads its social media. Then we have Professor Neil Greenberg, He's Professor of Defence Mental Health at King's College London. He served in the UK Armed Forces for more than 23 years and he's published more than 250 scientific journal articles and book chapters. And our third person from the Nightingale is Dr Mark Tarn. He is a consultant forensic psychiatrist who previously spent 25 years in the British Army as a GP and then as a psychiatrist. He was the consultant on the ground at the Nightingale six days a week. So Nightingale team, over to you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here this afternoon and uh, hopefully you'll find uh, what we've got to say um, interesting. So uh, can I have my first slide, please? So basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a run through of um, the, the science behind what we did and then I'll leave Derek and Mark to describe what actually happened uh, in the hospital. So there's no doubt that working in um, intense healthcare settings, particularly during COVID-19, uh, exposes uh, healthcare staff to lots of risks. There's trauma, um, obviously in the form of people dying and, and other things that don't go right. There's definitely what's called moral injury, and moral injury is a situation which occurs where your uh, ethical or moral code comes into a strong clash with the environment you find yourself in. So you might not feel that you can do things that you want to, you might see things go on that you don't really think are right, and you might feel let down or betrayed by a higher authority. Certainly, um, workload and shift patterns, you know, people work very long hours in difficult um, PPE at times, uh, and there can be quite um, few opportunities to take breaks. And then the stuff that goes on at home, obviously lockdowns affected everybody. Um, and as well as whatever goes on at work, you've got potential bereavement, you've got sickness, you've got homeschooling, you've got marital strife, uh, and who knows what else goes on. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, in terms of what we know about the impact of um, the current uh, pandemic on the mental health of healthcare workers, there's a recent review uh, published um, this month in the British Medical Journal just out. There's actually quite a few reviews on, um, out on a similar topic, all trying to get into the journals as we speak. And basically this showed that if you look at the sort of small amount of data there, that healthcare staff uh, are at the front line are probably one and a half to two times uh, more likely to suffer with post-traumatic stress or with general psychological distress. So there's no doubt that actually being at the front line uh, is important. But the uh, the risk factors there you can see are particularly junior people, uh, young people, uh, people who've got things going on at home like children or family members. If you didn't have the practical support from your, your staff members, and of course there's the, uh, the touchy subject of inadequate PPE as well. Um, next slide please. So what we uh, did um, when we got to Nightingale um, was to try and work out what the evidence says is a good idea in terms of protecting staff's mental health when you're in a healthcare setting or any other sort of team setting. First of all, there's a self-check before taking up the role. So we didn't want people who have volunteered, because they were all volunteers, to, um, to come on board if they were going to be exposed to things that they couldn't cope with. So if they were perhaps living with a shielded person or a vulnerable person, was it really the right thing for them? What happens if they had a lot of discord or marital problems at home or children issues? You know, again, was it the right thing for them to come to come to work? When they went for their induction training, we were very clear that they should have a frank preparatory briefing. 
what we know about moral injury is that actually the, the first time that you come to make a really challenging and difficult decision uh, at the bedside shouldn't be the first time you thought about the challenges. So we wanted people to um, have a frank briefing, telling them exactly what they're going to face as far as they can, and actually to let them think about it beforehand and talk about it to make sure that they were prepared. There was this concept of what's called psychological PPE, which is a, a snazzy title for basically giving people some ideas about the sorts of uh, emotions and reactions they may experience, and also getting them to put together a plan, a sort of wellness recovery action plan, about how they would cope um, and what they might do to improve their situation should they become distressed. And then there was also role specific training. Staff were trained as best they could do to uh, look after the equipment and the patients that they were going to have to uh, work when they went onto the wards. And lots of evidence we uh, have from King's College London where I work uh, shows that actually if you have personnel uh, who are not properly trained for their role, actually that can have a really big impact on their mental health and it, it tends to make it worse. Next slide, please. So that was how we prepared people. That's what the evidence says about preparing them. Uh, when it comes to what the evidence says about what will keep people going when they're doing difficult jobs, lots of evidence that what's called camaraderie or unit cohesion is really important in terms of protecting mental health. So strong teams tend to do much better. And probably the most important evidence that we know is about, psych about supervisors. And supervisors have been shown time and time again to have a really dramatic impact upon mental health. And um, we know that what's really important about that is that they feel comfortable in talking about mental health and they should be able to have a psychologically savvy chat. When a shift is finished, rather than let everyone bomb burst and go home, what we wanted them to do is to spend a bit of time uh, talking about what had happened, but also checking in to make sure how people were doing, going back there to the supervisor aspect because supervisors are well placed to do that. We also know there's a very strong evidence base in favour of peer support. Uh, who are people just like you, so frontline people, but who've been trained in some sort of specific intervention, enabling them to be able to have a good chat with you and to spot indicators that you might not be doing well and to find a way to then get you to appropriate help or to support you. We also were very keen to have um, mental health teams on the ground. Um, Mark and Derek will talk about that a bit more later. But basically the concept that, that, that those teams were going to aim to use were the PIES concepts. And P stands for proximity, so treat people near where they uh, become distressed, don't just send them home. I stands for immediacy, don't just let things go on, uh, try and nip it in the bud. E stands for expectancy, so that's try the expectation that you're going to be okay. And S stands for simplicity, simple things make a difference. Next slide, please. And then um, during the time that they were going to recover, and to be fair, this is the evidence, but the Nightingale, as you probably know, you know, th this doesn't really apply. Um, but we know that actually when people recover, they should get a proper thank you. They shouldn't just go straight back to work. They should have a graded return to work. Some sort of monitoring or screening, NICE uses the term active monitoring uh, to keep an eye on people to check if they've got problems. If they have got problems, they should have evidence-based care. And that as supervisors, once again, have a critical role to identify people who might be in higher risk group people from a BAME background, those inexperienced people who are doing jobs outside of their normal duties, for instance, and also secondary stressors, you know, what's going on at home uh, and other things that might have happened. You know, some families, for instance, might be getting into poverty, even though the healthcare worker is still working. And the last thing is to have time for reflection. And that's a chance, an opportunity to, to make meaning of what's happened. And one of the ways that that can be done is through something called a Schwartz round, which is a reflective practice group. Next slide, please. So the conclusion of what we aim to do from the science is not to over medicalize, to try and very much nip it in the bud, to use the team as the support, main support, to keep it within the team where you can. We want the supervisors to have these psychologically savvy chats. You'll hear a bit about forward mental health teams and what they did. When it all finishes, a thank you, a phase return work, reflecting and keep an eye on people, do what NICE says and have active monitoring and provide evidence-based care if you need it. Thank you very much. That's uh, next slide, please. I think that should be the end. That's me. So now on to Derek. Thanks, Neil. Uh, I have no slides. I'm going to talk for a few minutes just about how we tried to implement that in practice at the Nisegale site. And then Mark will do which, what might be perhaps one of the more interesting parts, more interesting than mine, I suspect, is talk about how that actually worked in practice. Uh, so to overlay Neil's points, to go back to the induction, I, mean, I think the thing that was really striking for me, some of you will have been at the Excel Centre in London before, it's, it's enormous and I felt it the first time we went in we were to me excited to set up something new and that felt meaningful but just to go into the building you get the sense of at the time what it was going to become 
and the the stress of working there it was a unique environment it was the largest clinical site i've ever seen and and part of the the preparation with the induction was saying that to name it just to walk into the building could feel overwhelming could feel frightening we prepared an induction video for staff that they would have when they joined and it was to say that to say it's okay to not be okay that it would be usual for your mood potentially to go up and down so it's just the physicality of the building the type of work we were going to do as neil mentioned about that the primary preventative approach was trying to get good information for people we didn't have much time in the specifics of the Nightingale. What we did have, we had resources, and we had resources that were probably unique and that other hospitals won't have. So we had the ability to do much relatively quickly. And I, I wouldn't say that we had unlimited resources, but we, we had a lot of, of um, ability to do things quickly. So trying to get information, so we had credit card size uh, cards for people. Again, as Neil said, you, you'll be aware that the Nightingale didn't upgrade nearly as long as was expected. So this was a rolling process at getting digital information up on the boards at the Excel, telling people where we were, about getting the buddying system set up and the post-shift debriefs. Mark will talk a little bit more about the reality of that, that the fact that, to me, the buddying system was such a nice idea, but the challenge is actually enacting that. And my sense was, any time you talk to people, they get that system, but actually getting folk to do something can be a harder thing in reality. And we had our well-being areas, so part of the preventative approach was trying to make the environment as comfortable as we could for people. And again, this is where we, spoiled is not the right word, but we did a lot of resource at the Nightingale. So the welfare area, lots of companies provided resources. I think John Lewis provided the furniture, so it was nice. The layout was good. It was outside our offices. It was signposted. There was a big emphasis on trying to have adequate food and rest stations for people. There's lots of food, the, the, the food was fantastic. So places for people to go. The secondary part was trying to have that ready, the, the nip in the bud part, as, as Neil would say, that we were trying to have people walking the floor. We had what were called welfare work, walkers. These were by and large furloughed airline staff. And you can't have enough of these people. They're absolutely wonderful. If you, if you want to talk to people who understand other folk, outside of mental health but I think people in the airline industry are wonderful and their job was to walk the floor see how people were doing that special lanyards that would identify them the jobs were also to help with the post shift debriefs and that the managers had what as Neil mentioned those psychologically savvy conversations and we really came in uh, so that they were trying to identify if there were problems emerging that they would potentially filter people onto us which was the tertiary part the thing I enjoyed most uh, again if that's the right word about the model of the nightingale was how keen we were to demedicalize problems and I, I don't know from talking to some people outside of psychiatry i think some folk had concerns that a group of psychiatrists were going to go in and throw icd-10 at the building and that really was the opposite of what we were about and that was one of the things i felt most proud about about that model and in that it was saying to people it yes it's it is difficult and it is hard and there a specific reflection from me about the work at the Nightingale is I think we sometimes forget in mental health, we're quite good at naming things and reflecting on stuff. It becomes second nature to us. And I think for a lot of staff from non-mental health backgrounds, and, and some of the staff were quite young, quite junior, to be able to say stuff that was difficult, that of itself was, was new for some people, I think, to say, Feel a bit crap i don't feel so good with things and part of the work was enabling people to do it and neil talked about those pies principles that you, you you didn't need a long referral process to get to us yes we didn't expect people to walk straight in to see a psychiatrist if they had problems or different ways they could come in but they simply could just walk in the door and people would talk to them and the staffing in a sense the staffing matched the workforce and patient flow that we had at the time which never approached anything like capacity but it was a 24 7 system it was primarily run on the ground by psychiatric nurses mark was the primary psychiatrist on site myself and neil were there to support he did the bulk of the psychiatric work and mark will talk more about this in my other comments and reflection on nightingale was was my, i had a particular pleasure in working with some ex-military mental health folk who, who were really absolutely astounding and I, I, something I think they probably don't all recognize the strength that they've drawn not just from the mental health training but also from the military background and of course that's not something we can necessarily replicate so 
what was interesting for me was getting that model up and running on the ground. And I think an amazing job was done by a lot of people. And I'm not trying to praise art, the three people on screen. I'm talking about all the people who are trying to set this up in a really, really short period of time. So we had the benefit of resource and we had the hindrance of time to do it. But I, I think we established pretty much all of the levels that Neil talked about, barring perhaps the, the, the recovery part that we never got to enact. That's probably a good point to pass to Mark about how it actually ran on the ground with people. Thank you, Derek. Um, so the, the main thing about the Nightingale was was really the tempo. People are probably aware that the actual um, facility was up and running in nine days, and that that sort of tempo followed through into the way that the operations were drawn up. So we had to put together a mental health team very quickly. Uh, luckily. Uh, we knew many people from our previous deployments in the military who were available at short notice. We pulled them together and assembled the nursing team as it went along over the following few days. Um, this was in parallel to the first intubated patients coming into the uh, Nightingale. We were lucky we had a good skill mix. So we had um, a nurse coming from IAPT and we had a consultant nurse who was a CBT practitioner. Uh, and they, within them, the four of them were able to provide 24 hour, uh, 24 hour facility. Um, so they were, they were accommodated on site and they're available throughout the day and the night and um, we tended to um, have two of them in the in the mental health team uh, uh, office. Um, so one of the problems was also op uh, choosing a, a place to site ourselves and people that are familiar with the Excel it's an enormous building so we chose about a third of the way down and being sort of co-located in the same bit that occupational health was and this was what was called the platinum suite this also became the well-being area so a, a program of activities were happening in there and we were, by our presence, and we were well signposted, we were available and accessible at all times. And one of the other things that had to happen very quickly was the standard operating procedures, which Neil drafted and Derek and I worked on, and they had to be up and running very quickly, and we pulled off the induction part of it to actually get them finished. A lot of the challenges you won't be surprised to hear were administrative and uh, bureaucratic. So we managed to get um, the uh, state-of-the-art computers um, but we couldn't ever access the intranet because we never actually managed to get the logins uh, despite filling out the forms and applying. I'm sure it would have happened if we'd been there longer, but after five, six weeks, we still were unable to gain access. This led challenges in terms of our uh, note keeping. So we were a paper-based system and then there were issues about securing the notes. And in the end, we did, we did uh, achieve a facility and, and enabled archiving. And we, we had quite a lot of support with that, and uh, particularly I'd like to thank the uh, Medical Protection Society who were able to give some guidance of what was um, a, quite a difficult problem to solve. Um, there are other HR difficulties. Uh, some of our nurses came from quite far off in Wales and Scotland, and there, were, there still remains difficulties in their remuneration, particularly for the expenses, although I think that will be sorted out. And one of the strengths, as Derek mentioned, was that we were aligned with occupational health. If the Nightingale had had the taken anything like the number of patients that was planned, there would have been a primary care facility and we were all being co-located. Um, one of the advantages of that was that um, we all came under the welfare and wellbeing umbrella and this led us to um, having our own meetings and also attending the 4pm operations feedback where we'd made some contributions, one of which as Derek mentioned and, and there was talked about the buddy buddy system, <clears throat> there was a, a difficulty particularly of getting the doctors to uh, align themselves to uh, another individual and then do a debrief when they came off but we fed back on that. The outstanding thing really was the sort of flexibility of the team and the Nightingale staff as a whole really. Um, we, we, saw, we saw much innovation and there was an element called the faculty which led the induction and the, and the feedback on some of the problems and at the 4PA meeting we would see some of the progress that was made. I've been asked what sort of patients we saw. Well we tended to see patients that were having either reactivation of their trauma, bearing in mind these are all staff, or they had things going on outside the Nightingale which were linked into the roles they were doing. So for instance, we may see someone who um, had a relative particularly unwell with COVID, but they were working, transferring some of the patients that unfortunately died into the mortuary and obviously that was playing on them. But our role was a, as a force sustainer to, was to ensure that these people were adequately supported and were able to continue in their roles. And they were all volunteers and they were all very keen to carry on in their jobs. As um, Neil and uh, uh, Derek said, one of the big things we were trying to do was normalise and normalise the feelings that you can imagine were occurring with some of the things people saw. We were very um, lucky to have these welfare uh, walkers that, that tended to be air cabin staff, although some were pilots or who were furloughed through the aviation industry. Interesting speaking to them, the main way they're taught to uh, calm people down on flights is, is using a sort of a tactile approach, which clearly wasn't 
uh, approaches in with the, with the COVID environment we're in. So we were able to work with them and come up with some different ways to uh, help quell people's anxieties, but also that they were much involved in in, um, in uh, flagging up patients that we saw later and were sent into our facility. The big thing that came out for me really was the flexibility of the staff and the Nightingale staff, staff as a whole, and the fact that um, this can-do attitude percolated throughout, and that you felt that any challenge that came up, the Nightingale team and hopefully part of us as the mental health team could actually meet it and come up with a solution. That's why I would say, Wendy. Great. Thank you. So, thank you, Mark, um, for that. And thank you, Neil, and thank you, Derek. It's really, um, really interesting. Um, and I think we will have time uh, for some questions. Oh, I'll just come on that. Um, Thank you. That was, that was really good. Um, and we will have time for some questions. It's lovely to hear that the Nightingale was a proper NHS facility, unable to get onto the Wi-Fi, unable to get your travel expenses. Um, good, good, to, good to hear that in a funny sort of a way. So um, our next and last speaker is from my specialty, old age psychiatry. It's Dr. Avimbola Padipi. Um, she's a consultant old age psychiatrist and deputy medical director with Oxfys NHS Trust in South East London. She currently does her clinical work on a dementia intensive care ward. She has over 10 years experience of working with people with dementia in different areas in London and the South East. Her areas of interest are in developing interventions that improve quality of life in dementia, outcome measures and clinical leadership training in multidisciplinary teams. She has a wide experience in the field of research and has a master's degree in psychiatric research from University College um, London. So over to you. Um. I hope you can hear me, but thank you. Um, thank you very much, um, Wendy. And it was interesting um, listening to Neil, um, Derek and Mark, and I can assure you that my experience is very different from what they were describing. And I was reflecting while they were speaking, sort of thinking, well, their, their facility was set up to deal with a pandemic. My ward and the staff on the ward just happened to have to deal with it as part of their everyday job. So um, first slide, please, or next slide. So I just wanted to give you a bit of context as to where I work. So it's a 22-bedded dementia unit. Four of our beds are for patients who have continuing healthcare needs and can't be placed anywhere else. So we are the only dementia ward for the three local boroughs of Bexley, Bromley and Greenwich. And um, all of our patients have behavioural problems associated with dementia of any age. So we've got an MDT and you can see the staff that are present within the MDT there and their multifaceted interventions. Um, next slide, please. So just to sort of set a picture and the context for you, those are pictures I took from my ward. So we're a dementia friendly um, unit and we're designed in, in that way. So based on the evidence from Stirling University and Bradford, that's the way the unit has been designed. And that's our garden, some of our activity areas, and that's one of the entrances and exits into the ward. Next slide, please. So my COVID journey or our COVID journey is the way I've, I've um, described it. And while I was preparing for this presentation, I was doing a lot of self-reflection. So at the time when the COVID crisis started, we had 20 patients on the ward and the first suspected case was on the 12th of March. Um, so the patient did have clinical symptoms, but at that time tested negative. Um, he was very unwell. And I can tell you that when the ambulance came to the ward and when they were transporting him to the acute hospital, they were dressed in full PPE. So they had the white suits, they had the FP3 masks. So you can imagine how that felt for my staff and I was on the ward at the time, so how that would have felt um, for them. So we had to sort of have a mini debrief after that first experience of what I can remember one of my nurses telling me at the time that I'm scared 
So we had to come up with a plan as to what we would do in order to ensure that we were protecting the patients. So we designed our physical health monitoring of temperature, making sure we were um, looking out for anybody that had a cough. And I must say around this time, <coughs> excuse me, the 12th of March, there wasn't um, a national lockdown yet. The guidelines that were coming out were very patchy. Um, in addition to my clinical role as deputy medical director, I was also part of the com incident command center. So um, I, I was on daily calls getting all this information, but the information was very, it was, it was very bitty. It didn't come out all at once. So the, they, they were emerging very slowly. So you almost had to play it by ear. So we had the second patient with symptoms a, a, a week later and um, she was also transferred to the acute trust. At that time, I had to make a decision with the MDT as to how do we protect this vulnerable group of people as well as staff. So even though it wasn't national guidance at the time, we had started restricting visiting to the wards. And I also felt that I needed to protect as many people as I could. So I was trying to discharge patients but anybody that works in old age psychiatry, especially on a dementia ward, will know how painfully slow that can be. So um, by Easter weekend, which was the first weekend in April, 80% of the patients on the ward were symptomatic and or positive for COVID-19. And 60% of our regular staff were off sick. At that point in time, the ward was closed to admissions. Next slide, please. So um, we had to make some very rapid decisions as to what you will do, because you can imagine that if you're working with a limited number of staff, you don't know the patients. These are patients who have high mental health and physical health needs. And just to give you an example, I've got a 77 year old man who was coughing, supposed to be isolating. He also used to spit. There was nothing anybody could do to keep him in his room. And we were lucky that we've got some ensuite rooms. So isolation should be easy. But if you have a cohort of patients with dementia, I can assure you that isolation is extremely difficult and you have very concerned and worried staff and you have patients who are walking freely around. How do you manage that? So we used to have daily meetings with staff. My, my clinical role is two days a week, but I felt that at that point in time, I needed to be very visible. So I was on the ward every single day just to touch base, review the patients, make sure staff were okay. And then as we've heard um, in previous presentations, there were the initial concerns about PPE. Before, I, before the COVID pandemic, from my point of view, PPE was philosophy, politics and economics, which is what my son did in university. But I've heard so much about PPE and read so much about personal protective equipment over the last few weeks, it's incredible. So there was also the concerns about the unknown nature of COVID. There was so much news, social media on the news, everything for days on end was about COVID and the number of deaths. And when you're working on the front line with that, it's just very difficult to contain. In addition to this, and we've heard some of it in, in Neil's presentation, the staff also undergo a brief reaction. The average length of stay on my ward is about four months. So the staff get to know the patients and their families pretty well. And out of the 20 patients that I had at the start of the pandemic, eight of them died. So you can imagine from a staff point of view, and even from my point of view, I've never experienced that before. I've never gone, I've never lost that many patients in such a short period of time. So there was also this sense of helplessness. And it was a case of, at some point in time, you have to go into survival mode. You just want to survive and you want your ward to survive the patients and the staff you have. So the kind of multifaceted intervention that I spoke about previously had to stop and we just went for basic management of human needs and trying to manage the health crisis as much as we could and i've already discussed the problems we had with isolation next slide please so um 
my reflections and I can assure you that I've spent the last two months reflecting almost on a daily basis as to what could I have done differently, what should I have done differently. And I keep thinking about um, the kind of infection prevention control process because if I have somebody that has diarrhea on the ward, if I have one or two, the ward gets shut down and closed to admissions very quickly. For some reason, this didn't happen with COVID. Um, we, we seem to be waiting a lot for national guidance. And I, I can understand that it was a new and, and novel illness, but I keep asking myself that should we have locked down the ward earlier? Practical help is very important to staff. So I know Neil mentioned and Mark talked about the furniture they got from John Lewis. We don't have that kind of setup. The wards weren't set up in that way. I'm lucky that there is a staff room on my ward. So I took to providing lunch for staff. We would have a chat. Um, things like PPE not arriving on time, I would go and pick up PPE. So very practical kind of help that people could relate to and know that they were being listened to is what I did. As I said, I was very visible just to, it was a case of we're all in it together. I wasn't going to sort of um, back away and virtually support my team. There needs to be an acknowledgement of anxieties and sometimes what is unspoken is much greater than what people do say. But on the other hand, and I'm glad that Mark and Derek and Neil referred to it, you don't need to medicalize everything. People are resilient and those that go into um, the health and social care kind of setting do have a natural resilience. You also need time to stop and pause. So um, it was interesting to hear about debriefing after every shift, although we didn't do that. There were periods because we've got big open areas in the ward where I just sit there and within a few minutes, somebody else will join me and we'll have a quick chat. So that sort of provided a space for people to stop and pause. And I constantly ask myself the question, could I have done anything differently? Would I do anything differently? I'm hoping that there's not another pandemic in my lifetime, but I suppose we're supposed to learn as, as we go along. Next slide, please. Um, there's always light at the end of a tunnel and there's a rainbow after it, there's been a heavy downpour. So we did have patients that were very ill that went to the acute hospitals and came back. We had patients on the ward that were mild to moderately unwell that we managed on the ward and they did recover. So as you see, as you start to have patients that recover, there's a sense of hope that builds up in your staff because they can see that what we came into health to do, which is to make people better or to improve their quality of life, you start to see that happening again. And staff who were unwell also got better and they started returning, which means there's some kind of normalcy that returns to, to, to your ward. There's some kind of equilibrium that starts to get back to normal. So we have continued with our daily timeouts um, for staff and we're talking about what do we do next. We have had a huge, we have lost a huge number of patients. So one of the suggestions that have been brought forward is that should we have a memorial for those patients so staff are able to express what their feelings were in relation to this. Next slide please. So that's my final slide, and I know we will go on to questions. But from my point of view, that's how working um, over the last eight weeks on an inpatient COVID ward has been. I've had the opportunity of being both a clinician and having a managerial role. So maybe I've been able to navigate the system better than some of my colleagues, but I, I won't by any means say it was easy. I listened to the previous speakers with awe thinking, I wish we had that, I wish we had that. Um, but that's just how it was um, for me. Thank you. Thank you, Abby. That was really good um, and actually really moving. And I was one of the people sitting in the centre trying to 
write the advice and really aware that as we were trying to write it, there were people out there living it and in inventing solutions. And I've also done a lot of reflection um, on this and what could we have done better. But as you said, there's not been, there's no living memory of a pandemic and, and that hasn't, that hasn't helped. That was, that was really good. We've got lots and lots of questions. We're not going to get through them all, um, but I will start picking some out. The first lot came in for the um, Nightingale team. Um, oh, Derek, um, hopefully you could you could um, pick this one up. They're asking if there were um, any newly qualified doctors working at the Nightingale, and if so, how did they find that? Did you actually have? Because I know a lot of people were sort of rushed through the end of medical school quickly. Did any of them come to the Nightingale? So, so I'll, I'll take that one just to start off. So, yes, there were. In fact, that there was a, there were psychiatrists as well who were trying to get um, into the wards, you know, to be help to helping out uh, with the ITU beds. But the the range of staff was just amazing. So I remember we would speak to the staff as they came off shift just to get a flavour for what was happening. And there was, for instance, a paediatric uh, audiologist, you know, whose job it was to measure, you know, the hearing in kids who was working next to a bed, you know, someone who was intubated under the supervision of a of a, 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 you know, a, an ITU nurse, but the ITU nurse himself had, hadn't been normally a supervisor. So there were, there were some really junior doctors. Um, I'm not sure, I don't know if anyone else saw any medical students, but there were, there were definitely lots of people who were working way above their normal level of competency. And I have to say the majority, when you spoke to them, were loving it. They, they, they loved the team spirit. They, they thought they were doing really, really well. But inevitably, unsurprisingly, there were some who were saying, I, I, I don't know what I'm doing, I shouldn't be here and, and this isn't right. I don't know if D Derek Mark, have you got any other? Not really. I mean, I think it's interesting that um what the Nightingale brought out in people, there was a retired a retired GP couple in their 70s who were working ward side with the uh, ventilated patients, which is incredible what some people did. Lots of questions about PPE and wanted to know exactly what PPE. So again, if we start with the Nightingale, um, what PPE did you use there if you were um, actually seeing patients? Did you did you see patients? Because I think a lot of them were ventilated, weren't they? Um, did you see patients? And if you did, what did you wear? Mark, do you want to pick up? Um, so uh, we didn't actually see any of the ventilated patients. Um, we were there just for the staff. And there was um, there was like a, a, a area that sealed off, almost hermetically sealed, but the donning and doffing of the PPE took place. We only saw the staff away from that area in, in, in our facility. There was going to be a step down facility for patients that had been extubated while they were waiting to be moved uh, back to COVID ward. But that was never really fully used, so we had no uh, clinical presence there. Can, 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 I, just, can, I, can I just have one thing? That just, yeah. sorry, sorry to interrupt, because I know Abby's going to have far more experience of talking about this reality than we are. The other thing I'd say is just that we, 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 our team at King's, just done a, what I think is quite an interesting paper, which we looked at um, the psychological health of military personnel who were deployed um, and whether they reported having the right equipment or not. And we looked at that because we had that data sitting around from uh, studies we'd done some long time ago. It's due to come out in occupational medicine pretty shortly. And we found that people, troops who were deployed and said, I didn't have the right equipment, were about two and a half times more likely to report mental health problems. So it's not about whether they did have it or not. That's an issue which I don't know the answer to. But, but if you felt you didn't, then actually that's a risk factor. Sorry, Abby, for jumping on your yeah i i would agree with that neil it, it, it's a perception of what you think is appropriate equipment and because there was just so much in the media about um we're not protecting nhs staff and the guidance kept on changing but cha it, it it would have it, it seems slow to staff but when you look at how the nhs worked it was quite rapid so the guidance kept on changing and once there was always the, the issue of availability of ppe People then think it's been it's been it's been held back so that they're not being protected. So that, that was one of the issues on the front line. I think it's fair to say that the communications around PPE were not were not good. I mean, I was sitting at the centre of that. I spent a whole weekend um, talking about PPE with with various people, and it really it it didn't go well, did it? It really didn't didn't go mm. well. Um, another question for Abby about visible leadership. 
um, you said that was important, and I'm sure that was important. How did you um, how did you balance that with exposure, um, and how did you think about your own um, safety? Because obviously, it wouldn't have been particularly good for your team if if you've been ill. Um, how did you manage yeah. that? Um, I, I suppose the type of leadership or the type of leader I am is that I won't ask people to do what I, I won't do myself and I would just make sure I take the appropriate risks. So um, the PPE that we were issued, I made sure I wore it when I went to see my patients. Um, I did all the infection prevention control measures and because I think you have to model as a leader. So when people see you modeling it, they, they will tend to feel um, much less anxious and I felt that that was a responsibility that I had to take on um, and I must say that I think it has paid off because we, you, you gain a level of credibility um, so that, that I did make sure I, pr I protected myself, I did everything that we were asked to do so if people saw me doing it they would do the same. And just another question slightly personal but I think people know did you did you catch it? No, did you get I didn't. I, and I was tested, and I don't mind saying that. So, but right. yeah, but I'm still, I'm still doing everything that I'm supposed to do to stay alert and protect myself. <laughs> and then there's an, another question um, uh, asking for a bit more um, detail. You, you talked about um, a patient spitting, and I know that that's something. So I'm an old age psychiatrist, and I know that that's something. That, that's that's come up um, amongst my colleagues. How do you manage somebody with dementia? Um, and it isn't even dementia. Anybody with another psychiatric illness who could be really disturbed and who won't um, won't isolate. And how did you actually manage that? Did you have to use more medication? Um, what did you do? Um, I I did what we would always do in te in terms of taking a stepped approach towards managing somebody with medication being the last resort. But it's just that in this case, you had to take into account the protection of other people. So other patients and other staff on the ward. So we knew his pattern. He came out in the evening um, and there's nothing that you could do that would make him go back to bed. So we just worked around his pattern of behaviour. And whenever he was out in the evening, make sure that all the other patients were in their room. And there could be a question of what you were doing to protect them or were you depriving them in some way but that we felt that was the safest way at that point in time to manage it and when he did come out all the staff that were there at that time had to have their have to have their PPE on um, and they were quite they were quite used to using quite a lot of PPE because they're helping people with personal care on a regular basis so they were almost throughout their shift in PPE on, on that ward and that itself comes with certain issues. So medication was my last resort and I'm happy to say I didn't have to increase medication. We just went with managing his behaviour around his pattern of behaviour. Well done, That's quite an achievement. Um, another question about the nightingale, although we might even take it a bit broader uh, than that, moral injury. Um, did you actually see, and Neil, this is probably most your area, did you actually see any evidence of, of moral injury at the night ago, or have you seen it anywhere else? I know that was a big fear at the beginning of this. Yeah, actually, so I, 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 we certainly did, and I certainly have. So I'll give you one example who I think was a real you know, classic situation of a really nice uh, band five nurse, and she had been doing uh, some work in ITU before uh, COVID kicked off. And then it turns out that she got moved from one hospital to the Nightingale, which she volunteered for. Uh, and she came out and I was speaking to her after her shift. And she was troubled because um, she was supervising four other people who were not ITU specialists. She was junior herself and supervising them. And she it kind of all summed up really nicely by her saying she thought they were doing an amazing job, but she wouldn't let her mother come in there if her mother was unwell. Uh, it was not the sort of place. And I think that that kind of summed it all up. You know, I know we're doing our best, but this is not good enough. Uh, and so at that point, you know, she wasn't morally injured, but you could see that that had the potential to, to lead on to, to some bad cognitions if it wasn't handled properly. Certainly on a wider field, I know I'm uh, doing some work with NHS England more generally, and certainly the, the stories that are, are coming out are of people who are troubled by, by what's gone on, you know, not, not being able to deliver the right care, uh, feeling too inexperienced. Uh, and, and and really, you know, people saying this is not right. And partly going back to the uh, the, the PPE issue, 
is that we know that one of the aspects of moral injury is feeling betrayed by a higher authority. And therefore, whatever the truth is about uh, PPE, I think that a meaningful narrative needs to be created so that actually we don't end up blaming them because whether that's true or not, that's not helpful from a psychological viewpoint. That's really interesting. Um, and I was hearing about PPE this week. Um, the, the UK is actually using 10% of the current world supply of PPE. And I think that's a reaction to not having had enough at the beginning. Um, but yeah, that is something that we could do with thinking about. Um, another question for the Nightingale, I don't, don't know if it's relevant or not, but it's asking um, how did patients communicate with their families uh, if the internet wasn't working or were they just being ventilated and they couldn't talk? Um, Marty, I speak, you can I can, yeah, I can speak about this one. So there was a, a, a patient liaison cell and the uh, these were a group of GPs, uh, nurses, often transplant nurses, and, and what's um, known as the um, uh, first aid nursing yeomanry. So they were put into teams and they were assigned a ventilated patient. And each ventilated patient uh, in, in their area had a had a piece of work about them, the sort of, uh, about their family and about their um, about them as an individual. And then these teams would communicate um, with the relatives. And also um, there were um, uh, special phones on in the facility that were um, uh, in, in sort of plastic sort of PPE bags so that the nursing staff could, could communicate back and forth with the teams and also to the families if, if required. So it's quite quite a quite a good and impressive setup. Actually, but to, just saying they that really did a fantastic job. Yeah, they did do a fantastic job. But actually, it was surprising that some of these senior GPs who were really experienced, you know, some of them even making those calls uh, were finding it really tough. Um, and, and they were surprised yeah. by that because they thought they'd spoken about so much distress and it would all be OK. But actually, yeah, so it, that that liaison piece with families was was really, really challenging. Yeah. And I think it highlights one of the challenges with COVID-19 in all environments that we rely so much on family and friends and the support from outside. And this is an environment that's unique in separating people from their family and friends. The, the, the Nightingale is an extreme example where people are intubated, but if you're on a ward at the moment, we face this challenge now about not being able to let people in and out. And it's, it's very, very tough. Thank you. And another question for the Nightingale. Um, did military staff cope better than civilian staff? That's an interesting question. Derek to answer that. I, I have to say one of the things that I will, will take from the Nightingale is an enormous admiration for the armed forces in what they did in helping build the Nightingale. I think there's such experience with field hospitals and with this type of work and I have enormous respect for them, which hugely grew through that time. I do, I do think as someone with no experience in the armed forces that I think that the staff working there do, do bring it does I think it does give something else to their training and their background it'd be surprising if it didn't but I don't know if they're any less vulnerable than all the rest of us but I think there was something admirable to see in staff with an armed forces background so that's my way of praising Neil and Mark but many more people who were there as well actually one of the one of the reflections from some of the uh, liaison psychiatry teams I've spoken to at King's um, is that actually they, they've got a number of staff there who again are, are ex-military yeah um, and they, the reflection there is that they're finding it quite difficult because it, when it comes to crisis, the military think they're quite good. You know, they might have a lot of ridiculous things that they do and they do a lot of it. But when it comes to getting a group of people to do a task in arduous circumstances, that's when the military does come into its own. And so actually dealing with the bureaucracy that Wendy referred to, you know, when particularly at a time of crisis, it, these military people are going, how on earth can this happen? You've got to do A, B and C. It's obvious, isn't it? And then someone's going, no, you've got to fill a form in and, you know, we can't do that. And, and so they were finding it incredibly difficult to see how in the middle of a crisis, people could still say, I need a photocopy of you know, your driver's license before I can let you in the ward or something. And if I can say some of the learning from the Nightingale with that is not just about the work that was done for COVID, the management style in, in terms of cutting through the bureaucracy. So some of the learning that people talk about near the end is can we take this back to the NHS, the real ability to make change quickly and still do it safely. And it was a real eye opener. That wasn't just military. That was reacting to a need. Something had to be done. We couldn't wait for weeks and weeks. So could we follow due process and a governance trail and yet do things rapidly? And it was excellent for seeing that. It's, it's, it would be amazing learning to take back more broadly. Thank you. And, and I think that learning um, 
as well uh, we've changed in the college so you know it used to you've worked with the college you know it used to take um to get something up on the college website would take about 18 months if you were lucky um and we did it we got a suite of information up i mean i wish we had been quicker for people like abby but we did get a suite of information up within a fortnight um which was incredible and i think all of us have learned you can go a lot quicker uh we can't work at this pace forever but yeah mm. i think that's a big piece of learning to take away isn't it that we do have to get a little bit faster at doing things and sometimes you can cut the red tape and actually um, get a good result. Um, there's another question here as a management question. Abby, I don't know if this will mean anything to you or not, but uh, what's the view on critical incident stress management model, which is run by some trust to support people on the front line? Is that something you've heard of or do you have a different model? Um, um, no, I'm, I'm not sure whether it's similar to the PIES model that um, Neil was referring to in his in his um, in his presentation, but I think there is something about just being supportive. Um, it's a national incident rather than just a critical incident for your unit. So um, I don't know whether that answers that question, but we didn't use we didn't use that model at all in terms of managing the whole process. So just to jump in there, so CISM, Critical Incident Stress Management, part of that is Critical Incident Stress Debriefing. Um, so this was original Mitchell model psychological debriefing that NICE has made it very clear for 15 years or more that we shouldn't be doing that. And so although there's other bits to CISM uh, that, than the debriefing, um, certainly the debriefing bit is, is not good news, shouldn't be doing it. Uh, and I think as a model, uh, if you were using CISM, I would be you know, somewhat concerned because that's kind of out with what our current guidance is. I think as Abby described, I mean, and I think it was amazing, that sort of lead, you know, lead from the front, which I know perhaps is a little bit military, but actually do it by example, I think it, I think is so important. Uh, and, and I think that sort of approach which really shows people that you care. And certainly that's what we were trying to you know, enable at, at the Nightingale. It's really pleased to, to hear that that's happening um, in other places as well. Um, and we have an, another question. I don't know if anyone will be able to pick this up or not. Um, does anybody have any experience of dealing with someone who was admitted with COVID-19, but then also had a, a severe underlying mental health um, problem? Has anyone been doing any liaison um, work in the general hospital come across that? Yeah, we, we've, we've, well, I'm not sure what they've, they've admitted, but they did develop it. We have had somebody who was admitted um, to an older adult ward on COVID, with COVID-19 um, with underlying mental health problems. And it depends on what they present with um, because they, they were able to isolate in, in their room. So it wasn't as if they had behavioral disturbances. So we were able to manage that. I know my colleagues in psychiatric intensive care unit have had different experiences um, with somebody who, with people who were severely disturbed from the mental health point of view and also then have um, COVID, posit uh, COVID positive on top of that. But the National Association of Psychiatric Intensive Care Units did provide some very helpful guidance on how that can be managed. So that was available for people to refer to. Another question that might well become quite pertinent. Um, if this happened again, uh, and we all know that there may well be a second wave, um, probably in the autumn, when these things tend to get worse, um, and say the Nightingale, um, they've said the Nightingale Birmingham, so maybe it's somebody connected with Birmingham, is up in, and running again. And I guess the London one, it's only been mothballed, hasn't it? It's not been taken apart, it's still sitting there. What would you do differently um, if you were to re reopen the Nightingale? I, th I think I think one of the things that would be really helpful is to try and integrate our, from our mental health viewpoint, integrate our mental health support plan right at the top from the beginning, rather than have it as an add-on uh, which was brought in. I, as Mark said, I don't think we blame anybody. You know, nine days to set up a hospital is pretty amazing uh, to start off with. Um, but I think having it having it uh, from the from the beginning is really useful. I've actually been in touch with um, six of the Nightingale hospitals around the country, Birmingham, and there's Exeter and Harrogate, uh, Bristol, there's, there's a few of them. And we, we kind of started a kind of a, a, a sort of peer group uh, to try and sort of share good practice. And it's really fascinating how some of them where the psychiatry liaison psychiatrist in charge has, has, has really good connections with the trust uh, management. You know, things have gone really smoothly, mental health staff support built in, not a problem. 
and others have been instantly put into the battle of saying we're a mental health trust we're not supporting that general hospital piece you know we're pulling our staff back and all the kind of difficult systemic difficulties that go on anyway in in healthcare settings so i think having someone who's integrated with the management you know from the start and at the top i think is really useful both both for patient delivery for ill patients but also for, for staff support i don't know if the others think anything different yeah, I agree. I think it goes back to Wendy's earlier question about providing psychiatric care to for any of the patients there. That wasn't something that was tested, but it was an anxiety it had it come to pass and had it scaled up. And I don't think we fully nailed down. I think there were we had the. I think it would have happened, but I think it wasn't quite clear that the lines of communication with that. And I think again, going forwards, in one sense, we're very grateful that it didn't scale up. But it would there would have been a significant staffing issue for for getting mental health professionals onto the team quickly and I think that's something again where you probably need the local trust to be linked and that's not a reflection on on, on anyone locally because of that but I, I think that's something we want to be clear on next time about how to ramp up staffing fast. Okay thank you. Um, there's a question about what did we mean by the narrative on PPE and yeah good point we're not trying to um, tell a different story from what happened, but there has been lots of um, lots of rumour. Um, what we probably need to do is try and get a straight story of what actually did did happen um, around PPE. So yeah, thank, thanks for that point. Um, somebody else has asked about Schwartz rounds. Did anyone use Schwartz rounds? Um, did you use them at the Nightingale? So, so we we never quite got to the point of of actually uh, actually using them. The idea of reflective practice was used in terms of the uh, well-being areas when staff came out there was lots of opportunity for people to sit down and talk uh, nhs england actually is just about to launch um virtual schwartz rounds being run by the point of care foundation who are a, a group in the uk who run schwartz rounds anyway so that for people who can't access them locally or, or just don't know you know how to, to do them that's a useful resource that i think will be useful nationally for anyone in the nhs who wants to join those um, but the evidence for them is is reasonable, uh, and and I, I think the idea of reflecting about what what has gone on to develop that meaningful narrative, I think, is a useful thing. Short rounds are not the only way of doing it. Mm. Um, Abby, yeah. Abby, did you do short rounds, or what did you? No, do? we didn't, because reflective practice is already embedded in the way we we, we run the ward. So there's weekly reflective practice. And um, what we just did is just have the stop and pause. So just being available to anyone who wanted to speak. But we've already got reflective practice embedded in, in the way the wards run anyway. And about reflective practice, do you have any outside support? Do you have a psychologist or psychotherapist or anyone? Or do you just do it as, as a ward team? We've got a consultant clinical psychologist as part of the ward MDT. And if we did want access to outside help, I suppose that's the advantage of having the deputy medical director as your as your consultant. So you, I can access various other things for the ward. That is an, an interesting question. Do psychiatrists have to start seeing patients face to face again? Well, Abby, I guess you've been seeing patients face to face. Yeah, they, they haven't gone the away. <laughs> They're still there. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Um, I haven't. My stuff has all been um, all been over the telephone so far. But yeah, I think the answer is we are going to have to start seeing patients um, face to face. We're going to have to work out how we can do that um, safely. Yeah. OK, um, another question. How should we support colleagues who are suffering from COVID? Anybody had a... That's a very interesting question because I did have a number of colleagues that had um, different um, severities of illness with, with COVID and something that our trust had set up right from the outset was for line managers to provide support. What I realise is that we don't have as many contact details of people that, as we think we do and we certainly don't have up to date next of kin information but we, um, we got the line managers to provide individual support um, based on so either weekly check-ins or twice a week check-ins either with the patient or with their or with the, the member of staff's family or with the member of staff so that's how we've coped with it and it will be interesting to see um, the post-covid recovery of staff that have had quite severe illnesses and how that plays out over the next few months 
um, we've run out of um, time now. We've reached the end of the hour. Um, as always, that has been really, really interesting. Thank you um, so much to our speakers. There are lots of questions that I haven't been able to um, ask. So what we'll do is we'll send the questions out to the speakers and then eventually, this is all being recorded and will be on the website. Um, and eventually the answers to the questions will be um, on the website. So um, thank you, thank you to the audience and have a lovely long bank holiday weekend, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye.